All right. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> we are so excited to have you joining us again as we come back for season two here with our first episode of Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. Hello, everybody. So glad to see you in 2021. We're just so thrilled that you are back with us. And anyone who's new to us, we hope you're going to enjoy today's show and stick with us throughout the summer. Great. Well, I am Tania Kuntz, one of your co-hosts. And uh, let's see, if you haven't been with us before, I am in Nashville, Tennessee. I have been researching my own North Carolina roots for about 16 years now. It's hard to believe time has gone so quickly, but it's, I've had a blast in the process and really have learned a lot. And even doing these shows has been so educational. <laughs> and I'm Renata Yarborough Sanders. I'm here in Newport News, Virginia. Um, all of my ancestry on every line hails from somewhere in North Carolina, and um, I have been researching my personal family history since 1997. That's kind of my official year. I started asking questions in 1993, but I really dug in in 1997. So that's when I say I started. And I'm just so glad to be here with you again for our season two of Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. That's right. So do we want to perhaps give an overview of how season two is going to be run? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So you are obviously here watching us live for our first live show this season, and we'll be introducing our speaker pretty soon here. But we're going to have three live shows over the course of the season on different topics related to North Carolina. And then in addition to the live shows, what else are we doing, Renata? So we will be doing just the one live show each month this summer, and then we will follow that up with continuing with our research chats that everybody seemed to enjoy so much. So we didn't want to stop those. So we will do a live show on the first. Well, it's actually not going to end up being the first Sunday of each month because of holidays, but we will do a live show early in the month, and then we will follow that up two weeks later with our research chats, just as we've been doing uh, throughout the winter months, but with a little twist this time, because we're going to ask that you share during the research chats something about how you have used what you learned during the live show for that month. So we're just adding that little tidbit in to the chats. Great. So let's see, we have our speaker, David, with us today. Hi, David. Hey. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> Excuse this me. is David McCorkle. And David, if you just want to say a quick hello, and then I'll formally introduce you right before you speak. Hello. <laughs> David, where are you? Tell us where you are and a little I'm bit about Car you. I'm in Cary, North Carolina, which is just right outside of Raleigh, state capital. Mm -hmm. Love Cary, yeah. So Tania is going to just do a little mini presentation, if you will, and then we will get right to our speaker. And I just, you know, I see so many of our friends, Tania. I don't oh, know yes. if I can name them all, but we'll try to get to you at different points during the show. But hello to Mary Inman, to Daphne, to uh, oh, Genealogy TV. There's Connie with us today. <laughs> Mavis, who's always faithful, and Janice Gilliard. Who else do you see in there today? Oh, my goodness. We've got um, Ashley with us. Kristen. Welcome back, Kristen. Uh, Edvin Singh. He's a buddy of mine here in Nashville. Hi, Edward. Eureka, it's always a delight to have you with us. Callie, uh, C Celestine, we are just so appreciative of y'all taking the time out today. <laughs> now, you know we cannot skip Ron Hayslip Hansberry, who's like our number one fan. So it's good <laughs> to see Ron and Monique is here, Diana. I mean, we really, these are, it's so great because it's like family, you know, a yeah. lot of these people have been with us throughout the winter for the chats and it's just been wonderful. I see Minnie Becton and Mildred Lynn, she made it. She's the one that needed to know about the time. And so she <laughs> made it here. And uh, if we haven't called your name, um, forgive us, but I see you and I appreciate you. And I'm so glad that you're all here with us today. So Tania, Definitely. I'm gonna turn it over to you right now to oh, do your great. little thing. 
Excellent. So we are here to talk about land records. And admittedly, I do not know a lot about land records, nor have I spent a lot of time with them. So I know we're all going to benefit from what you have to share, David. And so here is what I wanted to share, though. So I am going to, okay, here is a, let's see, I'm going to make this full screen. All right. So <laughs> my family roots, part of them go back to Edgecombe County, North Carolina. And this is a picture of my daughter <laughs> when she was a few years younger. This is back in 2015 at the um, grave site of my ancestor, whose name was Rufus Tannehill McNair. Now, Rufus is buried in Washington County, which is just a couple of counties over from Edgecombe, but he lived his life mostly in Edgecombe County. So this is one of the lines that I research quite a bit. So let me fast forward my screen. Now, what do I know about Rufus? Well, I know that he was um, married to a woman named Mariah Wimberly. And Rufus and Mariah, I know their marriage because of an 1866 cohabitation record. We covered those types of records in season one. So if you haven't seen our season one episodes, definitely go back and watch that and learn more about those. But this is one of the documents that I have that you know, shows their union. 1866, Rufus and Mariah. Well, in 1870, we have Rufus and Mariah cohabitating together. And then I do know that Rufus's slave holder, holder was Dr. Augustus Harvey McNair. Oh, and I see one of the comments, we have someone whose husband is a McNair. We have to talk. <laughs> so Augustus Harvey McNair was Rufus's slave holder. So I do know that from research. Now, when it comes to Mariah, I know from another cohabitation record that her parents were Alan Wimberly and Della Battle, and they were enslaved by Kemp Plummer Battle, who was at one point a president of UNC. Wow. And I, you know, I was really excited to begin to put together these details as I learned more about the family. Now, so at this point, I have several surnames that I'm looking at right in Edgecombe County. So Tannehill, McNair, Battle, and Wimberley. And let me just say that the Tannehill surname, my ancestor Rufus was Tannehill in 1866 and at some point switched to McNair. I know that Augustus Harvey McNair, the man I showed you his picture earlier, had a sister who married a Tannehill. And the Tannehill family was out of Virginia. So I don't think that the Tannehill was a North Carolina family because she married into a family in Virginia. So that left me really looking at McNair, Battle, and Wimberley. Well, I found a map of Edgecombe County from 1905 that shows some of the property of the families. And what I learned was that the Battles, the Wimberleys, and the McNair are all very close to each other. And I will admit, before seeing this map, I never really thought about the land and how their, their property would have been structured or divided or even the proximity too much until I saw this map. So this was one of the early pieces that I had that started to get me thinking that I needed to know more about how you know land is distributed, how land records are created, how we use them, what we can learn from them. And I did a little bit of looking on your site, David, and saw that there is there are some land grants that were um, purchased, I guess, by one of the ancestors of the Wembley that I think um, enslaved my family. So I am very interested in learning more as we get through what you have to share. So let me, I'm getting my mouse in order here. So let me remove that. Oh, we seem to have lost Renata. Oh no, hopefully Renata, you'll be able to come back. Um, but that is, you know, what I wanted to share, my little bit of knowledge about land, actually non-existent knowledge about land. So I'm really, you know, excited to hear from you and maybe I can learn something I can apply. Okay. <laughs> so we can go ahead and let me go ahead and say, that we'll hear from you, David, as you share what you um, want to share. Hopefully that'll give us time to get Renata back in. And then for everyone watching, we'll do some Q&A. So David, please feel free to go ahead and share your screen and I can get it showing for everyone watching. All right, are we seeing the screen? We are seeing the screen. 
Okie dokie, let's get started. Um, again, my name is David McCorkle, and I'm going to be talking about uh, land records. I have um, four or five different presentations I do on various aspects of land records. And so what this presentation, since this is in a shorter time period, I've kind of took bits and pieces of, of all of them to, uh, to kind of put this together. So some things will be a little awkward, maybe, but uh, it's kind of like the greatest hits, if you will, that I'm trying to do here. Hey, um, David. Yes. Before you start, now that I'm back, let me properly introduce you. I had a little glitch there. So uh, right. everybody, just to give David the proper introduction, uh, this <clears throat> is David McCorkle, and David is the creator of the free website, North Carolina Land Grant Images and Data. He is founder of a new nonprofit with a mission to provide public online access to images of original uh, word missing, researching North Carolina history and genealogy. David is president of the Durham Orange Genealogical Society, DOGS, or DOGS, and is on the, I guess I have a word cut off on, on my printout, uh, David, so I'm missing some words. I apologize. He has given copy lectures. And really quickly, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he has given lectures and webinars to national and state organizations on land grants, court records, digitization, maps, and mapping tools, uh, land records, DNA, and more. David is a native of North Carolina with deep roots on many lines dating back to uh, what is what is missing right there, the 1600s, David. Basically, Mecklenburg County in the 1700s. Okay. And he's been writing software since 1974. So let's welcome David properly. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Oh, my <laughs> apologies for also not stepping in, but we're so glad <laughs> to have right, you, David. No problem. <laughs> so basically, um, so like I said, I put a bunch of stuff together and I'll try to squeeze it into the time we have. If things start running short on time, I will uh, maybe skip over some things, but I'm going to try to cover, you know, Basically, you're getting six hours worth of lecture in 45 minutes, so we'll take it at that. Um, so basically, first to define what we're talking about in North Carolina when it comes to land records, um, we're talking obviously everything that's currently in modern day North Carolina, but Tennessee used to be part of North Carolina until the 1790s. So some of these land records are actually in what is now Tennessee. Um, also, the North Carolina, South Carolina border changed several times. Uh, especially the area around Mecklenburg County, Union County, where you kind of see how it's squiggly up there. That that There was all sorts of controversies over that. And if you don't know, if you want to guess when it was finally settled, just five years ago, December 2016, they finally signed the bill to agree on the boundary between North and South Carolina. So that shows you how this can get kind of complicated here. Uh, things are pretty stable with Virginia, if you're interested in that. So why, why does the government keep land records? Well, land is permanent, unlike most things they're keeping track of, like marriages and stuff, but land is permanent and people fight over land. So it's a good benefit for the government to keep these land records and not just to keep them shortly, but forever. That helps resolve these disputes. Um, you have issues with jur jurisdiction borders, like where, which county are you in? So the government would know that. Um, and North Carolina, we're fortunate that our records go back to the very beginning to 1663. And the other thing, is a lot of the records are kept centrally. Um, and that's useful if you're dealing with a burned county where you know the courthouse burned up and all the land records got burned up. There may be copies of them in Raleigh, which fortunately when uh, Sherman was here, he decided not to burn Raleigh. So all the uh, St North Carolina records uh, stayed, stayed intact. Now from a genealogy point of view, um, time and place, we're always looking for that for genealogy. And your ancestors, if you have a land record, it typically means they lived on the land. Now there was speculation and people buying property that didn't live there, but for the most part, if you find a land record and it refers to your ancestor, that's where they actually lived. They also had to sign documents to get this land in person. And so there's documents with dates on them. So that again, gives us time and place. Um, in rare cases, you can see actual signatures. Sometimes it's just the copy and the clerk's registers uh, copy, but there are some cases where you get actual signatures. Um, relationship inf information, especially in deeds, you'll see names of relatives, spouses, children, all sorts of people mentioned in the deed. You can also inf infer relationships via inheritance. Um, if you have a deed to a land and you're just giving it to your son, for example, 
you don't necessarily have to make a new deed. So um, you can actually see that, well, he owns the land, his father owns the land, it must be a father-son relationship or evidence of, let's say. Um, specific location of the land, that's what was mentioned at the start, trying to figure out where these people lived. If you're familiar with the Elizabeth Schoen Mills fan clubs, friends, associates, and neighbors, this is how you find the neighbors. Uh, clues to wealth, the person with 10 acres obviously isn't as wealthy as the person with 2,000. Um, occupations are listed. Again, you'll see these in deeds where it says, I'm selling this land to John who makes shoes or whatever. Um, and sometimes they'll even mention, I'm selling this land and moving to Alabama. So you'll see that kind of stuff in land records. Even evidence of name changes, we'll show an example of that later. Now, by far, the most common land record is called a conveyance, which is basically transferring land from one, a defined area of land from one party to another. So you have the parties involved, they can be individuals, they can be organizations, they can be the government itself. And you'll see the term grantor, which is the person who's selling the land, they're transferring the land from, and the um, <clears throat> term grantee is the person who's getting the land. You also see this word instrument, and that just basically means which document is used or which process is used to transfer the land. And there's two basic types. The first is called the patent. That's if you think of North Carolina, this giant vacant area back in the uh, 1600s or whatever, this is transferring that unowned government owned land, be it the king or whoever, to private individuals or organizations. And these are what are known as land grants, the grant of a land patent. Then we have deeds, which is the transfer of, un of owned land between individuals and private organizations. And the reason I put unowned in quotes up there is, you know, we obviously know the Native Americans were already here. And it's even possible that the person buying the land is already living there. They're squatting on the land and they're trying to just get ownership. So it just means owned as far as the government records are concerned, not necessarily whether somebody is actually living there or not. So what do you see in conveyances? Obviously the names of the party. So that's some good information right there. We get names. The land description will go into great detail on how to describe the land. Um, there's something called consideration as the price of the land. It could be money. It could just be, you know, Sometimes you'll see, uh, uh, you know, a dollar just cause it's your kid or whatever. Again, you'll see dates, you'll see signatures, the, the grantors, the person selling the land, witnesses, officials, and things like that. Um, so let's start out with um, describing the land. So the way land works in the United States is there's really two main groups. There's the federal public land states where land is distributed by the federal government and state land states where the st each state individually is distributing the land. So North Carolina and most of the 13 or the 13 original colleagues and a few others are state land states. The federal land states have a very nice, neat, orderly way of distributing land. So if you've researched there, you say, oh, this is easy. Why is this hard? Well, let's talk about the state land states. We'll skip the federal, but state land like North Carolina gets pretty complicated. So what you have to do is you're interested in some land, you go out and find it first, then you survey it. So it's not like it's laid out in advance. You just say, hey, this looks good over here. Let's get a surveyor and go out and survey it. So you're going to base it on things like the quality of land, um, you know, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, you know, if I want farm, I want good farmland for the crop I'm doing. If I'm like running some kind of business, I might need, want to be near a creek. There's also natural barriers. Uh, you know, I don't want my land on both sides of the mountain, for example. You know, somebody may already be there, so I don't want to encroach on their land. So there's a lot of things you would go into uh, defining it. You know, how much land do I want, et cetera. And I'm going to use a quick little example here of how land gets allocated in a state land state like North Carolina. And this will give you an example of why things are complicated. So here's a nice creek. And let's suppose I decide I want to get me some land and I want it on both sides of the creek. And it's a nice rectangle. So that looks all nice and easy. Then later on, somebody comes along and says, I like that area there. I don't want to live next to that guy. And plus, I just want my land on, on the west side of the creek. So he gets this land right here. Then somebody else comes along later and says, I like this area. I don't need to be near the creek. I don't want to be next to either of those guys. So I'm going to get this land. And notice it doesn't have to be a square or rectangle. It can be all sorts of wild shapes. Then somebody comes along and says, I want to look on, live on the creek. Oh, look, here's a little spot right here. And he just grabs this land right here. Then let's say property owner number one gets a bunch of money or gets established or whatever. He decides to buy all this land on the other side of the creek. 
So he lives there for a while and says, you know, this little border down here where it used to be number one, that really doesn't mean anything to me because it's all my property. So I'm going to consider all this my property. So now this is what it looks like. So the net result is you end up with something like this. This is a map of the original land grants in an area around Union Stanley County done by a, a distant cousin of mine, George Thomas. And you can see it's just basically a mess, a jigsaw puzzle. And the other thing to mention is the government, the state government did not keep track of this. So when somebody went out and made a, a, land, a land grant and got some of this land, they didn't go back to Raleigh and put it on a map. It just, you know, the surveyors just somehow figured it out. And um, the only reason maps like this exist is because of people like George, who have went back to the original records, followed the, the lines and the boundaries and the borders and the creeks and all that, and put together this type of a map. So it's a fairly complicated process. And you're not going to find this for most of North Carolina. Some areas are. Wake County's done uh, pretty well. A couple of other counties, because someone, again, has done that. But for the most part, you're not going to find these. So now we found a county. How are we going to find the property? And the first issue with the county, though, is counties change over time. Um, you've probably seen these maps. They split in two. You get new counties out of parts of existing counties. The borders changes. The names changes. Um, I'm using an, ex an extreme example of Greene County, North Carolina. So the area that's now green was originally in Craven County, and in 1746, it got split into Johnston County. Then in 1759, they split off Dobbs County from Johnston, which has that area that's now green. Then in uh, 1791, Dobbs split in two. They split it into Glasgow County, Glasgow County and Lenore, and they named, changed the name. The reason they did that is Dobbs was a, a colonial governor, and it's like, we don't want to name that after him, so we're going to name it after two patriots, Glasgow and Lenore. Well, Glasgow got involved in something called the Glasgow land fraud, and so <laughs> they decided, well, he doesn't get a, a county anymore, so they named it after Nathaniel Green. So basically, the net of this, if you're researching modern uh, land that's in modern-day Green County, you could be looking in Green, Glasgow, Dobbs, Johnston, or Craven County for those land records. And if you're new at this, you may not even know that Glasgow or Dobbs County ever existed because they're not modern day counties. So you can see how this gets complicated. And then within the county, excuse me, the reason this is important is you need to know the county because the documents were not altered. So if something was originally in this county and it suddenly became a different county, they didn't go back and change all the deeds. And likewise, they didn't move the records. It would just been way too complicated to do that. So the courthouse they're in, they stayed at the original place. Um, so it's real important to know. And how do you find these? In one of my presentations, I give a demo on this. But basically, there's been some books. But these days, there's websites. The one I really like is called the Newberry Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. You can see the link there. Um, or you can just Google, you know, Newberry Atlas Historical County. And it will actually show you the old boundaries on a modern day map. So you can say, show me the boundaries of this county in 1742 and it'll place it right on the map and you can see your street i use an example for example the uh, the old boundary between johnston and orange county went right through the middle of my neighborhood i'm in wake county now but it used to be John johnston or orange and i used to live in orange county you know or at least my land was so it's, it's very interesting uh, stuff to look at and it's not just for north carolina it's for the whole for the whole country because this happened not just in north carolina but everywhere Okay, so now we've got a county. We know the borders based on the Atlas of Historical Boundaries or whatever technique we use to find which county we're in. And this is where it gets really vague. They often don't indicate the exact location. You'll typically see on the waters of 12 Mile Creek, and that doesn't mean it's actually in the creek or anything. It just means sort of the watershed or the drainage area. Sometimes it'll say it's next to somebody else's property, but then again, you have to find their property. They'll give a starting point, which also is going to be, you know, if you're lucky, it's going to be something like a junction of a creek that you could find today, assuming the creeks haven't been renamed, which happens. Uh, but oftentimes you'll you'll see a tree a white, starting at a white oak. And, you know, that white oak probably isn't there anymore. Uh, they talk about pile of rocks and all sorts of things of these starting points. But at some point, you've got a starting point that you're going to have to find. Um, let me use an example, though, of how how this can get. This is uh, my um, fifth great grandfather, John McCorkle, who came, who got this grant in 1767. And it says he got 200 acres of land in Mecklenburg County in the east side of the Catawba River on the water of 12 Mile Creek on Liggett's Branch. So let's see if we can find that. So here's uh, Mecklenburg County today. And if we look at Mecklenburg County, we can see that the Catawba River forms the western border of Mecklenburg County. So if this is the east side of the Catawba River, then we're probably looking somewhere right around in here. 
So we just need to see if we can find that 12 mile Creek. Uh, but as you guessed, it's nowhere near there. Um, that's what Mecklenburg County looked like in 1767. It went all the way out uh, to the West and then also into the East, including what is now Cabarrus County and Union County. And in fact, this land is in modern day Union County. And the reason why is the Catawba River, after it flows down here, it kind of comes down here through South Carolina. Let's say, okay, great, let's get a map. And now we found it. There's the Catawba River right there. Here's 12 Mile Creek. So if I'm looking for the east side of the Catawba River on the waters of 12 Mile Creek, I should be looking right here, right? Well, to, to make a long story short, no, his land is way up here. It is 14 miles for the Catawba River. So if you mention the Catawba River, that doesn't mean he had Riverview property. Um, and then, you know, you take it from there. It's, it's again, a, a, a lot of work and hard to do it with just one land description alone. You usually have to get the surrounding properties to do a map kind of like uh, George did to figure that out. Now, I've got a starting point. Now, how do I describe the shape of that property? And they use a system called meets and bounds to describe the land based on natural and man-made markers. So your, full, your first, excuse me, you will first see a direction such as you know, north 90 or 65 degrees east or west and then south so many degrees. Uh, we, I'm not going to go into detail on all what that means. In fact, I teach a class on that. Um, it's a pretty, I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute. Let's just leave it at that. Then you need a distance and they don't use feet. They use all these terms like poles and rods and basically they're 16 and a half feet. Um, sometimes you'll see a chain, which is 66, and then they'll go to a corner, which is the same type thing as a, uh, that you see at the starting point, like a pile of rocks or a tree or whatever. They put all these together in something called a call, and you'll see something that says south, 15 east, 40 poles to an old oak tree next to the creek. And then, of course, then they'll abbreviate uh, south, 15 east, 40 PO, old oak tree, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the best way just to sum this up, because, again, I don't want to go into great detail on meets and bounds, is to um, show you an example. So just um, just follow my voice and see, and hopefully this will help you understand this. So we're gonna start at a um, an elm tree on the waters of 12 Mile Creek. This is a land compass you can use for mapping. I guess it's, you know, the old compass will look similar to this. And we're gonna go north 67 degrees east for 192 poles to a pile of rocks. Then we're gonna put our compass down there and go south 10 degrees east for 96 poles to John McKnight's property line. Then we're going to follow his property line south 50 degrees west, 96 poles to an old oak tree. And then usually at this point, they'll say in thence to the beginning. So they'll draw a line back to where you started out from and it comes to 100 acres. And I've yet to figure out how those surveyors could make it come out to exactly the right number of acres. <laughs> they had their little tools and tricks to figure that out. So basically, in other words, they take each line, each line of your property and take it from there. Okay. Now that wasn't always the case. Um, you notice as you drop through North Carolina and you get to a little town, all of a sudden everything's square. So you, towns were typically laid out. Um, this is Raleigh, uh, 1797. And you can see what they did is they laid it out and surveyed it and they had numbered lots. So then the deed would just say lot number 162. So you didn't have to go through these complicated descriptions. Um, and you can see exactly that without having to figure it all out. Okay. So what I'm going to start out with is the land grants, because again, think of that as the first time this land was defined and ownership was uh, assigned to it. So this is sort of like the first record for this land. Nothing else would happen until somebody owns it. Um, there's this mystique about land grants. Um, and uh, one you hear is that there's no way my ancestor was important or rich enough to get a land grant. You know, you always hear about them in this lofty language. They even talked about them in the Outlander series and all that. Um, and then you have the reverse side. I talked to people who say they got a land grant from the King of England. So my ancestor must have been important or done something special to get a land grant from the King. Right. And here's an example of a land grant. It says George II, by the grace of God, grants this land to Alexander Foreman. So here he's getting it from God and George II. So it must, he must have been something special. Right. Well, the reality is the King owned all the vacant land in North Carolina. So who else are you going to get it from? It comes from the king. It's just like I, I use the example of my daddy getting a, a signed letter from President Roosevelt saying he was drafted into World War II, right? Um, there were only like 20,000 of these grants from the king. But I mean, think about it. If the king only gave grants to his friends, 20,000 is quite a lot of friends to have. And um, 
the real key here is there's uh, 200,000 land grants and the vast majority of them happened after independence. So the king wasn't even in the picture. So getting one from the king really um, does, doesn't mean anything one way or the other. You didn't have to be special to do it um, and so forth. So don't, don't try to discount these land grants just because you don't think your ancestor would have had one. Um, there were some requirements. So before independence, the main requirement was to have a warm body. So basically they had something called head rights. If you had a head, you had a right to so many acres of land and it wasn't just your head. You could have your enslaved people's heads counted sometimes, your spouses, your children. It just, the rules varied over time. You could always buy stuff. That's always been true in commerce. Um, then you found the land you had to ask for it. As I mentioned, you needed money. The reason why is they nickeled and dimed you every step of the way. So just to apply to get a grant, you had to pay some money. They also had something called quit rents, which were annual payments that you had to pay to keep the land, kind of think of it like property tax. And then they even put obligations. And the reason why is, you know, England was a colonial power and they wanted, you know, people to come to, the, to America and settle and exploit all the riches and send them back to the motherland. So they said, for example, you had to clean and clear and enclose three acres for every hundred. You had to build a house. You had to, this one was a short period of time. You had to have cattle for every 500 acres. I think Today, we'd say that was the cattle lobby behind that, right? Um, there was another option, and that was you could be buddies with the king. I didn't mean to imply that didn't happen. It did. There was a guy named Henry McCullough who got 1.2 million acres of land, and there were other examples as well of people getting lots of land, uh, but they, they were the buddies with the king. Wow. Um, after independence, North Carolina is now a state. You still had the same process. Find the land. You, they nickel and dimed you. They got rid of all that head rights and stuff, but you did have to pay for the land. There were some exceptions, bounty land grants for military service, uh, especially in the Revolutionary War. Now, what happened is the bounty land was all in Tennessee. So, you know, if you live in Halifax County and you, you were in the war and they say, hey, here's this land in Tennessee, you're like, I'm not going to go to Tennessee. So a lot of times they would sell it to somebody else who then went to Tennessee. And there were a lot of actual fraud and scandals related to that. So let's quickly go through the land grant process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it was multiple steps and you had documents at each step and that's why it was really important. And it could also take many years to complete. So it kind of lets you do a timeline and things could cancel. So for example, somebody could apply for a grant, never go through the process and then leave the state and you would still have a record that they were in the state even though they never got the land. So the first step is the entry asking for the land. Um, they would just enter them in these entry books. So here's an example of an entry book from Mecklenburg County. You can see the different people applying for land. One being, guess who? George, uh, John McCorkle. He wants 200 acres on 12 Mile Creek. And notice underneath him, there's John McNeely and Robert Rogers also wanting him. So if you're into the fan club uh, concept, that's possible they knew each other, you know, right? Uh, the entry was very, very basic. He says he enters 200 acres of land in Mecklenburg County between Jacob Seacrest's land and my own. There's no definition of the land. It's just like, I've got some land. Jacob has some land. I want some of the stuff in between. It's that vague. When they um, accepted it, these had to sit kind of on public record. So someone would say, hey, that's already my land. I'm not sure how they would figure that out since the land description is so vague. They would issue a warrant, which I'll talk about shortly. But sometimes there was a... Uh, a conflict and someone would issue a caveat saying, this is my land, he can't have it. And you have some nice records that show this list of caveats here, some for, um, um, uh, I forgot what the county is here, Pitt County. Um, so these are the, these are all the conflicts and when they're going to get heard in court. So the warrant is really a kind of a boring document. It just basically repeats what's in the entry book. You do have some additional dates, so there's really not much to talk about it, but it's basically the order to the surveyor saying, this is all good. Please go out with the guy and find this land and do a, for a formal survey, which is the detailed description of the land. This is the one for that uh, John McCorkle's land. And his survey is pretty boring. It's just the lines and you can see there's no uh, geographical things mentioned. So just based on this shape, it would be pretty difficult to find this land. Um, there are the meets and bounds. Now, this is where the big description is. And you notice we have some more names mentioned here. There's Jacob Seacrest. He was the guy whose land we were getting in between. And now we have a third person, the widow Jackson. So now not only do I know he lives next door to the Jacksons, but she was a widow. And uh, depending on the presentation, I have a pretty long story I'll tell about this. But let me just suffice to say that the widow Jackson had a son that's on the $20 bill. Okay, so if you flip it over, always remember flip over these documents, even when they're on microfilm, you got to look at the back. 
you see John McNeely and Jacob Secret CB, that stands for chain bearer, and sometimes you'll see CC chain carrier. And the surveyors, they didn't have a survey team. They just more or less went out by themselves, and they had those long chains to do the measurement, and they needed people to carry them. So they would enlist typically family members or the neighbors or whatever. So this is a great source of name. In fact, notice John McNeely is the guy that was in the entry book we looked at a couple of frames ago. And Jacob Secrets is the guy who has the other land. And obviously, he wants to make sure the surveyor is not doing anything funny. So uh, that's another good source for names. And I do have to show this one. This is an actual survey from a land grant. And I mean, they did nice artistic work with ducks and dogs and hunters and everything. And uh, it was for Elizabeth Glasgow, who was related to the Glasgow, uh, who was the Secretary of State. So obviously, the surveyor was trying to like... Uh, help his cause or, you know, maybe get a promotion by drilling this really beautiful land grant for this woman. Um, the next step is they issue the patent. So everything's cool. They've got all the money, all the paperwork, and they assign a grant number and they record it in giant patent books. Um, here's that same John McCorkle in book 42, page 258. Um, they sent the grantee back a really pretty copy. This is one from 1783. Um, it's got the state seal down at the bottom. It actually has the original plat. So they get a really nice one. Um, I'd love to have John McCorkle's, but I'm sure it doesn't exist. But uh, you can find these at the archives and various other places. Um, then the last step is you were supposed to go register your grant in the county in the deed book. So you'll find land grants in deed books. So if we look at the timeline, we can see um, from the start to finish, it took about, you know, not too long, about a year and a half uh, for him to get this. But again, sometimes it's taken way longer. I want to quickly mention something called Granville Grants. Um, what happened? Um, uh, yeah, these are slightly out of order, but basically, um, let me go ahead here. So the original Carolina Charter looked like this, and it was uh, divided, um, or excuse me, run by the eight Lord Proprietors. You may know this from other North Carolina history. So they all were able to grant land within this property. In 1730, they decided to revert back to the uh, king, to the uh, royal government, except for Lord Granville. He decided he wanted to keep one eighth of the property. And, you know, how do you divide up one eighth when it's all over, you know, this huge gigantic area? And let me go back a slide. <clears throat> and what he did is he got this area in the green, which was called the Granville District from 1748. It took like 18 years to do this settlement until 1763 when he died. And I just put this quote here that not only did he get half of North Carolina, he got the better half. So if you have land in that area, you did not get your land from the state government. You got it from Lord Granville. OK, so technically, then they really weren't land grants. They were deeds, but they were very similar to land grants. Like you got vacant land from a large area. There was a central land office. You had a four step process, but the, they didn't have a patent book. Instead, they like had three copies of the deeds. And there's some really cool stuff about this. I'll quickly mention. So. You'll see the Granville deed, it'll say this indenture, and you see those squiggly lines at the top. What they would do is they would take those three copies of the deed and they would cut out a unique pattern with scissors. So what would happen is if you had the second copy, you could go to the state record or the central land office and see how the things match. These are two totally different copies, but you can see how the scissors more or less match. And just to prove the point, here's a totally different grant. You see it's got a different pattern. So if you tried to forge this and say, this is my grant, it wouldn't match those things at the top. So it's kind of like a very early um, anti-hacking mechanism they had. The other thing they had is actual signatures. So here's Miles Goforth's signature on this land grant. I'll show you one example where this is really uh, significant. This land grant is made out to, uh, this Granville grant is made to John Garrett, but notice it's signed Johannes Gerhardt. They're the same guy. So he uh, anglicized his name, and that's you know pretty good evidence of that from just this uh, Granville grant. So how do you find these things? Well, these patent books really all exist. Um, however, they're so fragile, they microfilm them all. So they're in uh, the microfilm room of the state archives. And I had all of them digitized, and they're all on my website, nclandgrants.com. So um, I have all patent books. There's like 200 of them. And it's indexed, so you can find the patent book entry if you're looking for a particular land grant. Also very significant is uh, the late Margaret Hoffman abstracted and indexed the patent books. So if you go to my uh, land grant website, it's indexed by the grantee name. She indexed every single name that's mentioned, not just the person getting the land, but all the other names that may be mentioned, the neighbors and all that kind of stuff, the widow Jackson, all that stuff is indexed, as well as all the locations, all the creek names and everything. And they're very, very, very significant. 
Um, this is an example of one of her, an entry in her book. You can see we've got all the different uh, property owners and so forth and so on. It's, it's so um, the unfortunate thing is it's, you know, it's her life work. She got up to book 39 out of 198 around 1780, right when things are really picking up. So the majority of them are not in his, her books, but all the older ones are. And the other thing is they're pretty much out of print. Um, uh, they're difficult to buy, but you can typically find them in any genealogy library in North Carolina is going to have Margaret Hoffman's land grant books. Okay, those other documents, the warrants, the surveys, they actually still exist too. <clears throat> Same deal, the State Archives has them online. And if you've ever been to the archive and seen their card catalog, about a third of that is the land grants. So you go up to the card catalog, you look it up, they're all done with a unique file number with each county. So that's how you identify them. And they put them in these envelopes called shuck. So you'll hear that word shuck a lot. That's what a shuck looked like. It was basically um, a long thin envelope and they took all those documents and shoved them in there. And this is the one for John McCorkle again. So he was assigned number 3040. <clears throat> now my website has about 20% of those online of those documents and surveys that pretty much I was doing myself. Um, what's happened I mean, the past year is a part of the reason for forming the nonprofit that was mentioned at the top, um, NC Historical Records, is to um, run NC land grants. So there's continuity in case I'm not able, able to run it anymore. And I just have to tell you a very interesting thing happened. I gave a talk on this to the uh, National Ge uh, Genealogical Society Conference and mentioned about 20 percent and how, you know, it's really expensive to get them digitized. It's like $16 a reel. Well, um, if you know uh, Judy Russell, she did a, a talk on this uh, platform um, last fall. She put a blog entry about it. And within three days, I got enough money to to digitize another 40 percent. So quite I mean, people money just started coming in left and right. So um, uh, that's kind of overwhelming the archives because they do the digitation. So, so it's going to take several months to get all those. But by the time they're done, we'll probably have 600,000 um, images of all these warrants and surveys. Um, they are all on family search, but they're on index. So it's just like looking at the microfilm. So it's, it's, you know, I can do it pretty quickly. It, you might have some trouble doing that, but if you really need to find them, you can find them on family search and, um, ancestry also has all those images, but, um, they don't have as extensive search capabilities as I do on NC land grants. And there's a lot of, you know, I could spend another 15 minutes talking about why it's better to use my website than ancestry, but we'll skip that in the interest of time. Those entry books, those original entries where they um, ask for the land, uh, the State Archives has the ones that are still in existence. And someone you might know, Dr. A.B. Pruitt, he has actually um, abstracted and indexed those just like Mrs. Hoffman did with the uh, land grants. So he has a series of books you can um, get from his website, abpruitt.com, uh, where you can look up to see if your ancestor had actually asked for these land grants. Even if they never got them, they may have asked for them. Now there's that grantee copy, that really pretty one. Again, they're not state copies, they're family heirlooms um, that people have passed down. So I hear from very now then from someone who says they have them. Um, you'll see them at archives and libraries, typically part of a private collection, for example. Uh, people collect them and sell them online, but the uh, vast majority of these no longer exist. I actually have a, a several myself that I bought online. Um, however, I did not pay $2,000 for them. This is one on eBay. There's a guy over near Winston-Salem who has a bunch he sells with uh, <clears throat> for these high prices. And what the price has to do with is not so much the land grant, but the fact it's signed by some governor like this is signed by Samuel Ash. So people pay for signatures, whereas I'm just interested in the land grant itself. So I thought that was kind of amusing. You'll see these, but every now and then one pops up for a hundred bucks and I'll get it. Okay. So that was land grants um, in 10 minutes when you normally can take an hour to talk about them. The other important one is deeds. Deeds are by far the most common land record. There are millions and millions of deeds for North Carolina and some are being created as we speak. Um, and they're recorded in deed books. Typically, um, they're stored at the county by the Register of Deeds. They never sent them to Raleigh. Typically, I guess if your title is Register of Deeds, you wanna keep the deeds. Um, and you'll see things like book 23, page 16. Now they have some wild numbering systems that vary and there's some books that help you um, understand those. Um, you've got letters and numbers like book 23B, 2C, and all this kind of stuff. But remember that the deed book record is the copy of the original. So if you have a deed, you take it to the register of deeds, they handwrite it into their deed book, and then you, they give you the copy back. So when you see a signature uh, and you say, oh, look, that's the signature of my ancestor. No, that's the signature of the register of deeds. 
and they even copy some. So like their books get old and messed up, so they'll copy the copy and mistakes can happy that can happen. The other thing that happens is the county courthouse burns down and they'll ask people to bring their deeds back so they can re-register them. So sometimes you'll have re-registered copy, not the original register. Um, they have index books on how to find them because again, these counties are gonna have hundreds and hundreds of these books. Um, the cot index is the one that you see used often in North Carolina. And what happens is you'll have two indexes, a grantee and a grantor. Um, sometimes there's multiple grantees or grantors like the man and his, his spouse or whatever. They typically only index the first one. And again, is where I mentioned the, the register of deeds is where they're located. The county is important for the reasons we already mentioned. Now, this archives does have microfilm copies of most of the North Carolina deeds. In fact, if you visit the archives and go to the uh, microfilm room, that whole middle section is mostly deeds. Um, you also will find them on Family Search as well. But again, they're not going to be indexed. Now, the, what's happened recently, though, is um, counties have started putting their uh, deeds online. And a lot of counties, they're going to only go back to, you know, 1970 or something, but some of them actually do have historical records. Um, this is an example of the deed books in Orange County. And you can see, um, for example, of scale, they're just really big things. Um, there's the deed book index. So let's use an example. Let's suppose I'm looking for Thomas Griffin. So I'm going to go to the G. He's the grantor. He's the person selling the land. Okay. So if he was the person receiving the land, I go to the grantee index, not the grantor index. So you'll see we have this section here. What they do is you kind of have to look for a, a range first. So here you can see at the very bottom, it says the Griffins are on page 85. Well, first I want to tell you that's not page 85. They call those set outs and 85 could be like six pages long. So just think of it more as an index as opposed to an exact page number. Um, so um, here is 85. And here we see the Griffins and it, the way it does, it shows the last name first and then it has three separate columns depending on the first letter of the first name. I don't quite get that, but that's how it works. So here we can see um, <clears throat> Thomas Griffin and we can see that he sold the land to Robert Glenn, October of 1818. And more importantly, it's in deed book 17 on page 82. So here's book 17, page 82. Now, strangely enough, it says that Elizabeth McDaniel to Robert Glenn. So I'm a little confused here, right? And you can see at the very bottom though, it's Elizabeth McDaniel, Thomas Griffin, and uh, John McDaniel. So there's actually three Gantors, but for whatever reason, they only indexed Thomas Griffin. <clears throat> or excuse me, they indexed all. And so in this particular case, because they indexed them all, I was able to find Thomas Griffin. Okay. Uh, it's probably like, you know, obviously John and Elizabeth were probably uh, husband and wife, and I'm not sure how Thomas fit into that. But, you know, again, that gives you stuff to go researching. So the idea here is though you look these up with the index, which will take you to the giant book and into the book and page. OK, um, now deed abstracts are very common. That was something that genealogists did, especially when genealogy started, counties started you know, organizing. It's like, what are we going to do? Well, let's index our deed books because they're real important. So you will find books in libraries which have deed abstracts. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Pruitt on his website lists a bunch of these that are available. So you can go to his website and see all the different counties where someone has gone through and actually ab typically abstracted. You're not going to see the whole deed, but at least you'll see the names of importance. You'll also see them in um, genealogy society journals. So this is the one for the uh, Union County Society. You can see how they've been going through and um, indexing these uh, deeds and uh, putting abstracts of them. Um, but a lot of them are online, as I mentioned, um, Family Search Ancestry. Um, if you go to the roots, uh, Gen Web especially, you'll can see, um, it'll say that the, uh, go under land records, it'll tell you that there are books on this or you can find them online or whatever. Uh, some people even have them on personal websites. Um, I'll go through this real quickly in the interest, interest of time because it's easy, but Wake County really has it down pat. You can look up by name. So I'm looking up the lanes. It'll take you right to the listing of them and I can pull up the exact detailed lane uh, deed and see information like my beloved son, James Lane. So there's some good stuff right there. So Wake is kind of like the top. A lot of them you see are kind of in between, like this is Mecklenburg County. If you go to the uh, online, you'll see something that looks like this, which looks really confusing, but it's really just this. They're saying this is the index book. So you actually have to go through a, a microfilm copy of the index book and then go to a microfilm copy of the deed book, but you'll get there. 
Okay. And again, uh, you know, let me know when I can stop because I'll just keep going through uh, to my hosts here. Now, there are mm -hmm. other, all sorts of records related to land. In fact, there's a whole collection at the archives called Miscellaneous Land Records. The content's going to vary greatly by county. And a guy named Stuart Dunaway has filmed and published many of these in books. Um, so here's an example of Mecklenburg Miscellaneous Records. You see there's plats and surveys, processioning, agreement to rent, boundary disputes, all sorts of stuff in these miscellaneous records. That's just an example of one of the folders. And you see it's just left, right, everything. <laughs> just looking at the title, uh, Rhonda Wynn versus Benjamin Wynn, controversy over wife's property of prior marriage. Man, look at all that information just in a tag on a thing that she was previously married, et cetera. You also find these processioning records. Not too many of these, but some counties have quite a bit. And this was a process to validate the lines of a given area by walking the property lines. Some just repeat or, or the meets and bounds, but others have named names and places. I saw one where the guy doing the processioning said he went to this guy's house and ate dinner with him. And here's his wife and kids. I mean, it's all hit and miss. But uh, basically, um, here's an example of one. And this says, uh, this is from 1764. They want to uh, procession all the land on Flat Branch Road and the county line along Bennett's Creek to the main road. So here you'll see all the names, who was present, you know, the parties present, et cetera. And I saw this was even interesting. Here's Elijah Sumner. It says he's underage. I'm not sure why he was there, but here's evidence right there of his age, just from a processioning record. Um, here's David, one where somebody, yes. Excuse me. We'd like to stop at 255. So you have about three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> all right. So um, this example just shows you that not only do you have time and place. It says it was the morning of the 18th of March. So now I have time, place and time of day. So pretty important stuff. Now, a good portion of these are court records. And I'm just going to quickly shoot, just to throw, shoot, uh, go through the examples. Um, you have things called civil action papers, the pleasing quarter sessions, estate records. So here's one where it says William Chavers, free Negro conveyed to Sarah Harris. So now you have a person of color and a woman mentioned in the same sentence. Um, this also mentions another enslaved boy. Um, this may be the only evidence of him. This says Margaret Williams died without issue on the 17th day of October. So again, these are land records that are in court, these uh, miscellaneous court records. So you know, not only did she die, but she didn't have kids. Um, here's some information about another uh, woman's death. Here he asked the ages for sisters and when they got married and their husbands. Here's mentions of age of underage girls. That's something you usually don't see. You know, not only there are women, but also you get their ages. You get petitions with all sorts of names. You see all those names listed on the right. Also, loose estates. This is um, Matthew McCorkle's estate, my fourth great grandfather. You can see how his land was divided up between his kids. And you see this area here where they're all small. That's because they used the purse stirpes where that meant the uh, his actual son died. So they divided it up between that guy's sons. Um, all sorts of things, bounty land, mortgages. Um, there's something called CRX, which are re records at the archives that are not, they kind of lost the chain of custody. Make sure to look in there. Here's some bounty land petitions where they mention exactly where this guy served in the War of 1812. A couple of others I'll mention uh, quickly, tax records. Um, so here's Pasqua Tank tax records. You can see um, how many acres of land the person had. Um, and I'll mention this last one. This is called homestead exemption. If you, for some reason, for age or whatever, you didn't want to have to pay property tax, you could petition. And to do that, they said, we'll list all your property. So this is kind of what you'll see in the States, except the person was living. I always feel like with the state sales, they've already gotten rid of some of the stuff in advance. You know, we did that. Don't tell anybody. But uh, um, so this, you know, they have, have what, uh, this is what they had at the time when they were applying for this exemption. And I'm going to end with this one example because I noticed this guy had 15 beehives. And the reason I'm interested in the fact he had beehives way back then is I'm a beekeeper. And this is me with a bunch of bees in my hands. Mm. And that's the end. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow. Man, we, we did not <laughs> want to have to cut you off, David. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Like I said, I threw it together from bits and pieces of all sorts of other presentations. So I guess I hit it pretty close. I hit it pretty close. Well, that was just wow. absolutely <laughs> Wonderful. And we thank you so much for sharing with us and sharing with our 
viewers and we do have a couple of questions and I actually have three questions <laughs> over here <laughs> um, and some comments to share with you. So um, right. I'm going to get right to it because it is almost three and we're obviously going to go over, which we have a tendency to do anyway. Um, the first question was from Connie uh, at Genealogy TV and she wanted to know, are you using Deed Mapper or some other software to create your maps? Um, there, well, I don't, the maps I got from other people. So for example, the map from, uh, George, a lot of people do them by hand. They actually get out pencil and paper and do that. There's other people like the maps of Wake County. There's a, a Markham map, which you can see at the, uh, Olivia Rainey library in Wake County. He used Dean Mapper. So it, it's really up to the individual mapping. And like I said, this, there isn't a formal process for mapping a county. Somebody will say, Hey, I'm, it's usually your ancestor. My ancestors here, just kind of like you showed at the start with that thing. I want to see what all the land grants were around here. Mm -hmm. So it's going to vary, but it's typically, if it's done electronically, it's almost always deed mapper. If it's done by hand, it's done by hand. And there's some people who've done some really beautiful things by hand that are almost like artwork. Well, I've never even heard of deed mapper, but I hope that answered Connie's <laughs> question. Uh, Relatively inexpensive. It's like a hundred bucks. It's a piece of software uh, you buy. And there's some okay. free stuff online too that you can use mm -hmm. if you're not interested in Mapper. And just um, Cindy's list has a bunch of them listed. So you can, there's several different, there's one called Meets and Bounds that works on Macs and stuff. So. Okay. okay. And we have a question from Benita Gibbs and she would like to know are historical deeds available at the state archives? I think you mentioned this. Yeah, they're available on microfilm, but the counties tend to keep the original copies. But okay. um, you, they, like I said, the um, there's you pull out a drawer for a county and it's always deeds, 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 you know, hundreds and hundreds. OK, great. Um, I actually have some questions <laughs> that Tania won't be able to put on the screen because I didn't put them in the chat. Um, I want I have three questions. So my first question is you mentioned that the bounty land from the Revolutionary War was only in Tennessee. And I'm trying to make sure I understand that because I have an ancestor, uh, Solomon Bibby, who got, who was a person of color that fought in revolutionary war. And he, I have a land grant for him in North Carolina. Then it may not be bounty land. It could just be. Oh. So what's the difference? B bounty land was cause they couldn't pay the soldiers. So they gave them land. Okay. okay. So, mm -hmm instead of money. But some people would say, well, I'll just sell my rights to somebody who's in the mood to move to Tennessee. But the problem is gotcha. even by the time the war, by the time they got to issuing the bounty lands, you know, everything was settled. It took a while. North Carolina was getting settled left and right. So there just wasn't any, especially in the Eastern part, there wasn't any land left for the most part. Okay. So they used Tennessee, you know, the Western boundaries and the other states did the same thing. Virginia, okay. you know, all the states, their bounty land was typically not in their state itself. Some were like in Ohio and places like that. Okay. I'll share that document with you later by email. It's very strange because it really doesn't, it's labeled as a revolutionary war land grant, but it doesn't really say anything about that. I'll okay, share it with you. Yeah. And then, um, was there an ending date for land grants? Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. 1960. The last oh, 1960. 1960. Wow. There weren't that many in the 20th century. So started, you know, this ended right around 1900 and something. There was maybe a couple of hundred at the most. But the last one was a case where it was some property that the state owned, like some kind of school property, and they reverted it back to the state and then granted it to somebody. To me, it sounds like something shady going on, but that was the last one issued. So and the original ones were actually, um, uh, there's not many records of them, but they started, you know, pretty much when the state was formed. And you also had okay. issues where people come, coming down from Virginia were already living here too. Oh. So it's not, when I say land grant records started in 1663, there were people living here who owned land before that. Before that. Okay. But, um, so you, you have to do, you know, if you're researching those upper counties, you've got to do some work to see if you can find the original owner. And then I have a last question and then I see another one in the chat too. Um, my last question was after the deed of mortgage or where you see this indenture between blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. Um, is there a follow-up document and where would that be? So like the first one, cause I've been working with these for a client, it says what the conditions are 
if the mortgage is not met or if the oh, okay. So then is there a follow-up document that lets you know that the amount was paid or whatever? Well, I mean, you're not going to get the, the deed itself until it's completed, right? Okay. And you, you have the thing. I mean, it's just like it works today. Um, like if you have a mortgage, you know, the bank really owns it, but you get like the warranty deeds and things like that. And it, it just, um, I, I can't go into too much detail. And other than say, it pretty much hasn't really changed on how that works if you're getting a mortgage. Okay. Um, and, you know, your land is tied to that. Okay. And then, um, Tani, I don't know if you've been grabbing some of the wonderful comments for David oh, too, but um, we'll share some of those. But the last question I see from Sharon Bruno is, um, Great presentation. There was a slide about other records that included insurance and cemeteries. Can you quickly share that list of other records? Is it easy for you to get back to that? Sure. Hold on one second. While that you're doing a, that, pretty fast, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we forced you. Yeah. <laughs> you have so many um, accolades. Excellent presentation. Thank you for helping us. Uh, know where to go and get assistance. Great information. Uh, Tania's putting them up. Okay, thank you so much. This was extremely informative. <laughs> Loaded with great information. Thank you, so, David. A lot of great sharing. accolades. So many, <laughs> so many I'm excellent, if you want excellent to, uh, presentation. All right, there all right. you go. Mm -hmm. All right, so yes, here's that list. <laughs> So tax right. list, okay. fire insurance. So yeah, I talked about tax list, fire insurance maps. Um, you may have uh, read about these and a lot of them are online now. So they're mostly like central business, but you also include some residential or basically they tell each building, um, they're called the Sanborn maps. They have each mm -hmm. building and like what it's made of and all that kind of stuff. So you can see those um, as well. Love Sanborn um, maps. And uh, mill and bridge and road records. Let me just mention quickly that um, road, we didn't always have the DOT. So when a road needed work, they would get the people who lived on that road to go work on it. And you'll see this in the court records. They'll call them road crews. It says so-and-so has been assigned to a road crew. And the first time I saw that and saw my ancestor, I was like, it sound, I thought it was like a chain gang or something. <laughs> but no, it's just that that's how they get the locals to, to build the road. So but with that information, you know that this person, these person, people live near each other because they were all assigned to work on this road. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an interesting one called the agricultural census, which they do, and they still do today, where you can see that your person, not only how much land they own, but like what they were farming. So, you know, he was doing corn. He had so many acres of corn and so many acres of this. Um, and then cemetery records, um, they're more just uh, the fact that cemetery is land. So a lot of times you'll see land records saying when the cemetery was allocated or who bought, you know, sometimes someone would buy a whole portion of that. So I just call those land records. Um, the newspapers, there's always something I'm selling land, I'm buying land, uh, city directories. Um, you know, I, mostly I talked about the country, if you will, but there was, you know, people in the city own land as well. So you could go through these city directories and some of them are in order of like just going down a street saying somebody lives here. Here's the next door person. Here's the next door person. Here's the next door person. So you can construct a city neighborhood based on these city directories. They didn't start till like the you know, late 1800s, but uh, there are quite a lot of those online as well. So, Great. you know, these are, I call these land records, but they're not technically land records, but there's land information in them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you've had so much information. Ron's asking, do you have any online classes? <laughs> you cover this in more detail. Uh, no, um, <laughs> you know, all my online work has been through conferences. As I mentioned, I did some just recently at the National Genealogical Conference. I did one specifically on the website, NC Land Grants, and another one called um, Other Land Records, which is basically kind of like what we just answered, everything other than deeds and land grants. I have a, an entire talk on that for an hour on those other land records. Um, I am teaching a class on how to do meets and bounds in September. If you go to land grants, you'll see a link to that. I haven't formally scheduled it yet, so it's just more of a trying to, to gather interest and it appears there's enough interest to do that. Um, and I don't think I can officially announce it yet, but there are some upcoming conferences that I will be doing some Great. talks on land as well. Great. Thank you. I see something from Philip uh, Hevner. Uh, and I don't know, Tania, we both seem to be having a little echo right now. 
Uh, so we apologize for that. But Dr. Robert McNeely has done many grants in Burke and other Western North Carolina counties using Deed Mapper. There's a book showing them that can be found in the Burke County Library, North Carolina room and others. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Um, Deed Mapper has a, a part of their website where people can upload their Deed Mapper files for free. And that's one of them up there. So you can actually, if you have the Deed Mapper program, you can go to their website and that McNeely land grant or Deed Mapper maps, you can download and pull them up in your own thing. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, it was a good idea, but I don't think they publicize it enough. So there just aren't that many. There's a, a decent amount for Virginia, but there aren't that many for North Carolina, but the Burke counties are um, one of those. And Burke is going to be, um, you know, I mentioned all those new counties that are going to get added to my website, the the documents. Burke is one of them because that was the one Judy Russell was interested in. <laughs> so I made sure to get hers first, so, you know, after all she did. Um, but yeah, so I'll be putting out an announcement soon on all the counties that are going to be upcoming. But again, the the archives has one person doing the digitization part time with the microfilm reels. And we've just, you know, I've been working with them to say, look, I've, I've got 400 reels for you. And they're kind of like, ah, <laughs> so. Um, you know, hopefully in a few months, we'll have a lot more information on the website. But the important part is those patent books, they have the complete land description and you can only find those on my website. I've never seen them anywhere else online or any libraries other than my website and the state archives. So that alone is worth going to the website to um, to see the description of the land. Uh -huh. um, okay. Well, David, we thank you so very much. It's clear that everyone has learned a lot today and we just want to remind everyone that you know, this is on our YouTube channel. And so you can go back and watch it again and again, or just rewatch the parts that you need a refresher on. And I know that, um, David, I'm probably going to be bugging you a little bit because I do have <laughs> yeah. that client right now that I'm working on some land stuff. And this has been a great uh, help to me. So just thank you. Kudos. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, yes, thank you. Enough. I like doing ones that are recorded is because that way I can talk faster and people can go play it back. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. it's, like I said, I'm trying to squeeze five hours into a short period of time. So I apologize for that, but at least you can go back and replay some things. We thank you very yes. much. Um, right. So just um, quickly, a couple of uh, announcements. Um, I'm not sure why that screen looks a little cut off, but Coming up next in July, our next show, which will be on July 11th because of the 4th of July falling on a Sunday, on the first Sunday, we're going to be talking about North Carolina's regional libraries. Now, last year, we had a wonderful um, um, show talking just about the North Carolina State Archives, but we want people to know that there are libraries throughout the state that have genealogy rooms, that have resources for um, researchers that will focus on that local area of the state. And so our very own Tania, along with representatives um, from some of the other libraries will be sharing with us on July 11th at two o'clock to get you ready for your road trip now that COVID is on its way out. Uh, we'll be able to get back to our personal research. And uh, contact information for Tania and for me is at the bottom as always, or you can contact us jointly at North Car uh, NC Summer Series. It's still 2020 <laughs> because when we did this and created all of this, we thought it was just for that one summer. So the email address has not changed, NC Summer Series 2020 at gmail.com. Um, okay, Tania. <laughs> oh yeah, I I think you covered it. We're looking forward to being able to bring that next episode to you. And then in the meantime, we do have the research chat, uh, which I think you mentioned a day earlier. So we hope to see you all back for that. We'll be sending out announcements. Um, so make sure to sign up for our email list, which we will put in the description for this episode. And about the research chat, um, we're, we're just having all kinds of holiday issues with this year's summer season. <laughs> so typically it would be the first Sunday for the show and the third Sunday for the chat. But because the chat is scheduled for June 20th at two o'clock in the afternoon, right in the middle of everybody's Father's Day celebrations, <laughs> we're going to do another Monday evening chat like we did once before during the winter season, and it seemed to be very well attended. So it will be June 21st, 
Monday evening at 7 p.m. is when our June research chat will take yes. place. Great. And we also just want to remind you to be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and ring the bell so that you'll get reminders and to Nia, the email list. Yes, we ha we'll have an email list that you can sign up for. We send out announcements through that. Um, and of course, our Facebook page. We post on our Facebook page. So keep an eye on that. Be sure to follow us and make sure you get all the posts that we, that we share. And thank you to everybody who shares our post, whether it's on uh, Twitter or Facebook or wherever you're seeing it. We really appreciate it um, because we have our regulars, but we also have a few new names in here mm -hmm. today. So we're very happy to see you and uh, hope that you'll join us in two weeks for the research chat and be ready to tell us how you've used something that you learned from David today. We'll uh, do that with our celebrations. Uh, anybody who has something they can share about how they used land records uh, because of David today. <laughs> and thank you, David. I hope you will save the chat and just go back and read all the wonderful comments that they're still pouring in right now. Um, you've definitely done us all a great a great deed. I'm going to use the word deed. <laughs> Even though it's pun, pun intended. Yeah. I, need, I need a nap. Okay. <laughs> but thank you, everyone. We are a few minutes over, but that seems to be our MO. So that's just how it is with Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. We look forward to seeing everybody on the 21st and then again back here on July 11th for the next live show. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. And David, thank you so much again. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>